You're listening to Psych with Mike. If you enjoy the show, then help us out. Go to Apple Podcasts and rate us and leave us a comment. That is so beneficial for the show, and we would really, really appreciate it. But in addition to that, you can follow us on Twitter, at Psych with Mike. You can like the Facebook page, at Psych with Mike. And now you can even catch us on TikTok, at Psych with Mike. So please subscribe to all of those different ways to stay connected to the show. And as always, if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike. Welcome to the Psych with Mike Library. This is Dr. Michael Mahan, and I'm here, as always, with my good friend and colleague, Mr. Brett Newcomb. How are you today? I feel like I've got the gain on your mic turned way up, and I can hear you and my mic. You know, we have to talk to somebody about the technical quality. The techni- I know. The technical quality of this show is horrible. Yeah. But uh, before we go off on a tangent, we are delighted and so privileged to have with us Dr. Ravni Tobler, who is a practicing OBGYN and the CEO of Scotland County Hospital here in Missouri. How are you, Randy? I'm super good. Thanks for uh, thanks for asking me to be on. You mentioned that you have technical challenges, which is exactly why I'm on. So uh, that's good. <laughs> well, no, I'm, uh, you know, you're, but, but you're... The, the truth is that you know I am a trained clinical psychologist who does this podcast and you know do all of that work besides my regular job. So is for myself. I am absolutely amazed that I can do this every week and actually get something that is even intelligible on the air every week. So I'm impressed. Well, you do, and and, and I know you and I share the love of broadcast, and I know that um, it it provides an outlet sometimes for some longer form discussion than we can do on regular broadcast. So I'm I'm thankful that you do this. It's a great service that you and Brett offer through the podcast. It's well, thank a you. great medium. Yeah, we appreciate that. So what actually, the reason that you're on is because you had asked me to be on your show. You were actually on Camel X, so shout out to you. You're a big Camel X guy now. And uh, <laughs> I had heard that week on KFTK, which is your home station, you had done a couple of interviews on the vaccine. And so uh, when I came on your show on KMOX, I said, hey, can you come on and do something with us? Because, you know, there's a couple of things. Number one, I recognize that we have a vaccine. That doesn't mean that COVID-19 is a thing of the past. And talking to you and hearing about how your rural hospital is dealing with this, it's pretty dire still, isn't it? It is, and it's um, it's largely a human resource issue. I think um, in rural parts like we are serving, I think it's both a human and a capital resource problem in the metro areas, where there's just a shortage of beds. But in our uh, in our neck of the woods, when we have a surge, uh, that affects, of course, the infection affects our staff mm-hmm. um, pre-vaccine and until vaccine. Um, but also, so that decimates an already uh, shortened workforce. But in addition, um, we may have enough beds. But when we already have a limited staff and then some of those get cut down and are out temporarily, it, it just runs into a problem. And you just can't hire agency nurses. They're nowhere to be found. Um, and, and furthermore, the, the staff that are there are running on fumes at this point mm-hmm. because it's just been a long haul. You know, So it's, a, it's an interesting management problem, not only just from the practical aspect of serving the patient's needs, but, but trying to support a, a, and encourage a staff that has just been um, – I don't know. I, this is probably the closest I'll ever get because I was never in the military. It's probably the closest I'll ever get to those those uh, those movie scenes we see where the, the, mm-hmm. the platoon is just about at wit's end and dwindled down to just a few of its members, and they have another battle or two or three or four or how many more to fight. That's the way it feels. Well, on the agency nurse end, I read an article today that the agency nurses really are almost impossible to get because the traveling nurses and the agency nurses are making well north of a hundred dollars an hour right now and they get a contract and before that contract is even over somebody else offers them a contract for more money and they leave and go take that contract no absolutely i mean it's it's (laughs) you hate to say this about and they really are heroes because Mm -hmm. they're 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 providing unbelievable service but on the on the pure business analysis of it, it's very mercenary at this point. And in a way, I guess I don't um, I guess I don't blame some of these folks who like school teachers and others like, like psychologists. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
underpaid and woefully mm-hmm. overworked for the very heavy lifting that they that they do and have done for years. And I think maybe this is just a little opportunity for them to to uh, to get recognized in a time of the most dire need for for the service they've given not only now but in the past. Mm-hmm. But you're right. I mean, there we can't compete with the. And remember, when you say a hundred dollars an hour, that may be what the nurse is getting. Remember, you're paying a an agency fee on that. That's, mm-hmm. that's way north of that too, from the from the purchasers. That's uh, just amazing. So. It's crazy. Yeah. And so before we turned the mics on, we were talking to you, and you had said you have to go back to the hospital after this interview because your colleague has been diagnosed. So what are your guys' numbers looking like? Yeah, well, it's funny. In the community, and we we do most of the testing for a, roughly a four-county area in northeast Missouri, the far corner of northeast Missouri, and some of the southeast Iowa um, uh, counties as well. And so we get a pretty good regional, I would say maybe about a oh, 75 to 100 mile um, radius um, of, of just a general disease prevalence. And we peaked at about 38% on a rolling seven day average in late October, wow. early November. Yeah, I mean, that was crazy. And uh, today, I was really happy. I never thought I'd be pleased to report on the, on the, the check in calls at the Incident Command Center that we do with another local hospital. Uh, last week and the week before, we were down to you know mid-teens, and I thought that was a triumph. Well, today we're back up to 21 percent, and I, I sense that's probably going to be um, pretty much the the norm for the next couple of weeks here mm-hmm. post holiday. Because of Christmas, right? Yeah, that's crazy. Now, good. The good news is not all those people are landing in the hospital. Mm-hmm. Those are just positive tests. Yeah. Um, we're very very thrilled, and I'm and I I just hope that folks that are listening. If they are diagnosed and if they are at risk, and if they're not sure, they should ask their doc if they're at risk. Um, you know, they may have mild symptoms that led to the uh, to the to the swab, or maybe they're just a contact. But um, with with the use of these uh, monoclonal antibodies, the two products that have had emergency use authorization in the last couple of months, uh, BAM Lenimumab, as we call one of it, and the other is Regeneron, the one that President Trump got. Mm-hmm. We've really seen a marked reduction in, in hospitalization and the, need, and the progression to severe disease. So until everyone can get vaccinated, this is going to be a good bridge therapy, along with remdesivir and the other things we've learned on how to treat hospitalized patients once they do land there. But that's a really underappreciated, sort of, a, 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 unfortunately, a well-kept secret is the availability and the use of these monoclonal antibodies. They're remarkable. Well, you're absolutely right, because hearing you talk about this is the first time that I can actually remember hearing about like Regeneron and, and these other things. Can you go a little bit more into that? So these are not, these aren't cures. These aren't vaccines. They're treatments for people yep. who already have been tested positive. But we now do have some treatments that are really helping people with the course of disease and really minimizing that. Right. And it, it really, I think it, it, if people will think about well, they, they, you may or may not be aware of what's been done with hepatitis A outbreaks for a long time. If if uh, if you uh, were eating out at a at a restaurant today and you heard on the news tomorrow that there was an outbreak of hepatitis A and one of the workers hadn't washed their hands properly and you know they they, they traced the source, probably wouldn't locate it in a day or so. But mm-hmm. um, everyone who was a, who ate at that restaurant within a you know they they do a calibration of who would be eligible, but they would uh, they would give you anti hepatitis A antibodies. Mm-hmm. And that would really help reduce the, the scope of the disease and if not eliminate the, the, the infection itself, at least reduce the severity of it in those patients. So what you've heard about convalescent plasma from people who have gotten well and then they you know, will, will process their plasma to, to get the antibodies. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's been used for 50, 60, 70 years in medicine in various applications. Well, the, the pharmaceutical version of that, these monoclonals as they're called, are really just synthetic antibodies that are targeted at the same um, spike protein that we've heard about that the new vaccines that have been developed are targeted against. So it's a way of reducing the viral load. And why it's so important in this disease is we find that um, in my conversations with people that know vastly more than I do at the bench level and trying to stick, stay up with the, with the physiology of this virus, it appears as though it, it is on the offensive replicating and duplicating itself using our cellular machinery mm-hmm. um, for a longer time than most viruses before our immune system catches up and starts going on the on the offensive. And that may be because uh, unique to the virus, it appears to, at least in the people that get the sickest, but probably in everyone to some extent, it seems to actually paralyze the immune system for a while or not activate it as effective. So 
So anything you can do to reduce the initial viral load and, and sort of slow down that replicating process of the virus while your immune system is sort of, it's almost like I, I'm envisioning a, you know, a prize fight where the guy, one of the, one of the, one of the uh, competitors throws an uppercut right off the bat and knocks the other guy down and he's mm-hmm. dazed and it takes him a while. Well, this makes that uppercut into a, into a hard jab. Gotcha. And it gives, it gives uh, our immune system a little chance. And that's the way I envision it. And, uh, and that way, and see what happens then if you follow it through to people that don't get the antibody. If you, if you have a tremendous viral load that replicates and replicates, finally the immune system um, catches up. And then it, it's like, um, it's like uh, you know, a conventional rocket landing in D.C. and someone pulling the nuclear trigger in D.C. Mm-hmm. And it's just it's an overreaction, and that's what we hear about with the carnage that results in so many organ systems with an over-inflammatory, a hyper-inflammatory response. So these, so these things are wonderful, and they're, uh, they're just like sponges to sort of attach onto the, onto the virus, and then our, our gobbled up uh, uh, you know, part of the immune system takes care of those immune complexes, and that reduces the load. Gotcha. So the monoclonals will actually not stop, but reduce the, pl- the, the replication of the virus. Well, they don't reduce the replication. But whatever, by the time that it's diagnosed, usually people are going to be symptomatic. That's the typical setting. Mm-hmm. Someone comes in, they have early symptoms, or they're, they're a contact. And by then, usually by the time all that administrative bureaucracy follows through, they have some kind of symptoms. And in those people who are at high risk for advancing to, to disease, so not everyone would get it. A 20-year-old would not be eligible for the monoclonals. But a 50-year-old with uh, hypertension and a little lung disease or just hypertension alone, would, would be a good consideration. Mm-hmm. Now, certainly a 55-year-old or and above, and all 65-year-olders and above would be. So those people would then, um, they'd get the virus, they'd get the monoclonal, and they already have replication going on by the time they're three or four days from, from, uh, from infection and from you know, symptoms. So the closer to the development of symptoms you can get them. And it's only indicated, by the way, for folks that are outpatient. Mm-hmm. Once you've landed in the hospital, um, and it's a little oh, fuzzy gotcha. whether the ED does it or not. But some of the studies show that once you're in the hospital, you don't want to get these antibodies because it makes it worse. Okay. So there's a specific but very broad category, broad lane for the use of these antibodies. And so then is that going to reduce the total number of days that you would be sick? Is that the idea? Well, what it does is what we know experimentally is it reduces by about 70% progression to hospitalization and, and what is called severe disease, gotcha. there's clear criteria for that. And now, you mentioned um, slowing the replication of the virus. So once the virus gets in our cells, it uses our cellular machinery to, uh, to replicate itself. And remdesivir that you've heard about, now that is useful in hospitalized patients, not for outpatients. So it's a, it's a reverse of the other use. And that is, uh, you could think of that similar to um, Tamiflu. So if someone is really severely ill with the flu, they get Tamiflu, and that just that just slows down. It just sort of stunts the the um, the rate at which the virus is reproducing. So it has use, but that's more down the road. Gotcha. So you had said that there were two of these monoclonals. There's Ren, uh, Regeneron, which we've all heard about because that's what the president got. And then what was the other one? Bamlanivimab, and that is the, the Lilly product. So Lilly has a one uh, antibody product. And Regeneron has a two antibody products, and I won't pronounce those names, but gotcha. they, uh, they're similar. Yeah. So, um, and they both seem to have the same efficacy. They've been criticized, and and I full disclosure here, I'm I'm a, I'm a Wash U graduate, and I have I have some academic um, um, tendencies running in my veins, and I and I really lean on a lot of my good friends from Wash U and and other you know highly valued academic centers here and, and elsewhere for advice. But some academicians, I think, in this whole crisis. Um, have been much more um, demanding of um, traditional levels of certainty mm-hmm. when it comes to therapeutics um, than, than I think either are justified or I am <laughs> because of the severity of this. I think at this point, it, you know, there, there are some who have said, and I saw a webinar or a, a, a YouTube video just the other day from a highly respected, in, you know, infectious disease immunology person, up in the Northeast that said, well, th- th- these, uh, these monoclonals are a minor contribution because the studies on both of them, both products, suggested about a 70% reduction in that progression from mild to severe disease. Mm-hmm. Well, in my book, when you have hospitals, when you have hospitals overwhelmed and Absolutely. who knows with this variant, I mean, why not try it? Because Absolutely. Because there have been, the 
safety profile is, is really very solid on these things. So small study is something to keep in the back of our minds. And yes, it's not proof. It's not the five randomized controlled trials with a, with a meta-analysis behind it. We don't have time for that. Mm-hmm. We have to, we have, it's time for a little risk-taking, unfortunately, you know, in, in terms of pure academics. It's a little bit like uh, combat medicine versus ivory tower medicine. There you go. Yeah. yeah, right. I mean, you have to you have to do the best with what you have at, at the hand, and if you and everyone has to, I think, have the the honest realization that there, we may go down a wrong path, or maybe it's a null path, and it's uh, maybe another opportunity was lost because we went down the wrong path. And I think, in retrospect, we're going to need to have some grace and compassion for people that, in good faith, go down the wrong path, but are doing it for all the right reasons, with Just, as much evidence as they can. When you were talking a minute ago, Randy, you were talking about some a concept that I wish you would expound a little bit uh, called viral load. And my understanding is that the greater viral load that you have, the more at risk you are for severe types of COVID. Is that a correct understanding? And if it is... Yeah, I think it's fair to, it's fair to say that with any... Um, with any infectious disease, it's the it's the burden with which you present first your innate immune system, which is a non-specific response to anything foreign, whether it's a splinter um, or a virus or a bacterium, mm-hmm. um, and and that again seems to be a lagging uh, response in this co- uh, coronavirus thing. So, um, and then you have uh, the adaptive response, which is the more specific, the antibody and the memory T cell response. That develops, you know, a little bit later with whatever leaks through the innate response. So there, we're, there are there are scores of people, not only with uh, with SARS, uh, CoV two, but but with uh, everyday influenza, the common cold, and all those viruses that that are exposed and really never get sick. And mm-hmm. perhaps if we swab them, in fact, we know that if we swab them, they may have evidence of that in their nasal um, mucus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But um, you know they, they have enough of a of a of, a, of an innate um, non-specific immune system uh, immune response that they're able to to sort of with a combination of that and whatever leaks through an adaptive response never really gets sick. So we're going to go to our break real quick and we will pick this up on the other side. If you like Psych with Mike, here's a couple of ways that you could really help us out. You could subscribe to the show on Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok at Psych with Mike. But the two things that would really, really help us out is subscribing to us on YouTube, search Psych with Mike, but also going to Apple Podcasts and leaving us a review and a comment. And as always, if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike. Okay, we're back. So uh, with the monoclonals, Randy, and the remdesivir, do do we see, do you guys in your rural hospital, do you have enough stock of that that you guys can treat with that? Or is this like, you know, a white elephant? Like we know it's out there, but we just can't find it. My understanding is that with the monoclonals, they really did not um, take the same stance as they did with the vaccines, meaning there's a limited supply of those. Yeah. Now, that's been underutilized. And it's been widely reported in the national press. I was on a call that uh, we do frequently through the Missouri Hospital Association with all the Department of Health officials and public health and the governor's office um, about uh, three weeks ago. And we were only getting an allotment, an allocation, because it flows through the supply chain, comes from the feds to the state, and the state allocates based on on disease prevalence in the community and making their best shot at where it's going to be needed the most. And we've been getting allocations of, you know, between two and four vials a week. And mm. that was not what we needed. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have to call, I have to shout out for Dr. Randall Williams, who's the uh, the head of the Department of Health and Senior Services at OBGYN, I might add. So, you know, what can I say? <laughs> Being an OBGYN, what would you expect? He, he came through. No, I'm kidding. He's a good guy. And, uh, he said, hey, how much do you need? Here's my email address. And I, I request, you know, we, we did a targeted, focused review. We don't want to use resources needlessly. Mm-hmm. But, and I asked for 50 doses, and I got them. I mean, we got the, the wow. next day I got authorized, and we, they were shipped uh, then a few days later. And uh, so we have not gone wanting for that. And remdesivir is available as we need it, but we have a limited number of patients. I think um, folks that are listening in, in larger metropolitan areas, I think that could become a problem if these things were to be widely adapted, particularly mm-hmm. the monoclonals. So uh, can we test a person for their viral load to be able to get an idea of what we think the progression of the illness might be in that individual? Yeah, I think only in research settings would that be done. And even if it could be, it wouldn't be that instructive. Okay. Because um, the the viral load is one component of a very complex matrix of whether you, A, are going to be uh, symptomatic 
and B, whether it's going to whether it's going to progress to something severe, because of course you know children probably get some uh, with all of the mucus and phlegm flying around in, <laughs> mm-hmm. in children congregates, um, and to see how little uh, you know disease they have, now, they can in rare cases have severe disease, and we've read about that multi uh, system you know response that they can have, but. Um, that's because the their immune systems are sort of naive. They're virgin mm-hmm. immune systems, if you will. And so both their innate immune system is very strong, and they make a heck of a good adaptive response because it's the first time they've seen anything, and uh, their immune system doesn't have to sort out, is this foreign or isn't it? And so that's part of why we think, at least theoretically, why they do such a good job. Uh-huh. So they, they may that's an instance where they may have a high load and do well, and a, a young, uh, an older person who has a less robust immune response and a lower load may do poorly. Gotcha. So I don't know that, you know, uh, that that would be that helpful. We mm-hmm. have to go more on clinical risk factors for progression and, and gauge it on that basis. Well, what about the impact of the new vaccines? Uh, main news that I've been following lately says that the, the issue is going to be the distribution of the vaccine. And how readily available is it? What populations get it when? And the, the feds are sending it out to the states and saying, okay, states deal with this. And all the states are handling it differently. So what are your recommendations and for how it should best be handled in even, Missouri? Even uh, the 20 million doses that got shipped before the end of the year, which they were shooting for and right. apparently achieved, less than 7 million of those actually got into somebody's arm. Right. So Yeah, the, and the, late, yeah, the latest data I heard was as of the 31st. So at the end of the year, I thought it was, it's, it's now, I think, better than that, probably north of 10 million. But still, shy of what we were hoping for. Mm-hmm. But that's like saying, you know, if someone cures cancer, darn, why didn't you do it yesterday? Right. You know, I mean, yeah. I think that, I mean, I really think I'm, I'm very proud of the response. That oh, absolutely. Big, big evil pharma and the, and the government has. On the other hand, have there been glitches? Absolutely. And no, I think, was it a, was it a little case of overpromise and underliver? Absolutely. Yeah, no, no, I, was, uh, I wasn't meaning to imply that at all. I was just concerned about what your thoughts are as a medical professional in Missouri. What's right, the right. best way no, for and that's, no, it? No, and I know you weren't implying that, but I think you're right. It's, 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 there are more doses available, and it's disappointing to me, just like with the monoclonals, that we haven't distributed. Now, I can tell you that, and again, this is anecdotal. I don't have data to support this except right. in my own institution and in, in conversations with others, including some larger um, facilities that I won't name uh, in the state of Missouri and people who know uh, a lot of, you know, the first tier, and, and most of the states, and, and Missouri has followed, the like most of the states, the recommendations of the CDC mm-hmm. panel that, that tried to prioritize what is a limited supply. Um, these things will be rolling out more and more, but, there's, you know, we have to prioritize. And, um, and so tier 1A in the state of Missouri is uh, health care workers uh, and nursing home patients and long-term care facility patients. Mm-hmm. So those patients, the long-term and nursing home patients, are about 150,000. 130 to 150, and there's about 300,000 healthcare workers all told, all across all settings in Missouri. So that's about almost a half a million doses. Well, Missouri's come nowhere near to getting those, and so mm-hmm. what was originally hoped to be a rapid rollout of Tier 1A, and then Tier uh, 1B would be EMS and firefighters, and you know, on teachers, I think would be in that in some cases, uh, depending on the state, and um, and then on to uh, you know, people over 65 and people under 65 that are vulnerable, and then the general population. That's a broad brushstroke of the three of the tiering system. Mm-hmm. But um, that's all been delayed because the state is trying to do its best with what has uh, been less than projected uh, supplies. But mm-hmm. even with that, in my building, um, we <laughs> we received a hundred. We requested a hundred vaccine, uh, you know, vaccine doses of the Moderna, mm-hmm. and. Um, and, uh, and that was based on a survey that we did um, shortly before the request was made. And only 88 people said they wanted it. And I have 150 full and part-time employees. So there's a lot of people, including someone that drew my blood checking for antibodies. Oh, shucks, it's negative 12 days after the first vaccine. But I mm-hmm. figured they would be. Um, and she just wasn't going to get them. And other people in the building aren't. But they're just suspicious. We mm-hmm. live in a time, as you know, um, of a great uh, skepticism about government institutions mm-hmm. and things that places and people that used to be trusted. And so uh, people are sort of, because of the, the novelty of the mechanism of this vaccine, I think largely, and the overlying political environment we're in, I think uh, even healthcare workers who should be the first mm-hmm. ones to, to, to step up 
have been hesitant. So oh. some of this has been on the part of the recipient. Some of it's been distribution as well. And that really troubles me that if healthcare workers, who I agree, should be the people who are beating down the door to be able to get this, the jab, if they're not going to get it, then what is that going to mean for the larger population? Do you think that we are going to get to a point where we can say we have herd immunity, or do you think that's going to elude us? Yes, and unfortunately, I think that's going to be a much bigger proportion of um, people, quote, immune because they've had the disease rather than got the vaccine mm -hmm. than it would have been otherwise. Because I think that, um, especially with this new variant now, that at least on early analysis appears to have more transmissibility. And it's been found in Colorado, California, Florida, mm -hmm. and I just read uh, today now in New York. So it's here, and it's not going away, and if it is more transmittable, um, you know, it's it's just going to run through the population like wildfire before anyone can get vaccinated, mm -hmm. or before many as many could get vaccinated. So I think it's going to. That's how you get herd immunity. It's a combo of of infection and then passive immunity through the vaccine. Gotcha. And it'll be interesting historically to see how that all you know works out in the end. I, I think that'll be an interesting epidemiologic. Uh, investigative sleuth reporter business to get into. But you bring up a great point, one which I actually had not considered. We may end up getting to herd immunity, but not because everybody got vaccinated. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, and, and again, to use a very macabre joke, if I may, one of the things that we say to release tension in the operating room occasionally, especially when things are going pretty well, and we see a little bleeder is, well, all bleeding stops eventually. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, um, and, <laughs> and, and, and of course, we don't mean that uh, seriously. At well, all. But you the say point that. is, I mean, sooner, sooner or later, we're going to get to herd immunity, right? Yeah. And, and unfortunately, I'm afraid a lot of people are going to get sick and die mm -hmm. <laughs> that but, wouldn't have had to because of fear of the vaccine. Now, all of this is qualified in saying those people may have the last laugh if it turns out this vaccine, you know, um, you know, does something crazy, but mm -hmm. I just, there's no biological evidence and the data thus far doesn't suggest that. Right. And, you know, the truth is that at some point the vaccine will be available at CVS and Walgreens. And when we get to that point, then I think we can rightly assume anybody who wants to be vaccinated has been vaccinated. There's no reason to have any prohibitions after that. Right. No, that's right. Once all of the people who, and, and it, I'm proud of the state of Missouri, too, they're, they're today on the call that we had. Um, by the way, we're about 15th out of the 50 states in terms of number of jabs given. So, you know, it's oh, that's fantastic. So, so, so that's pretty good. I have to compliment the, the authorities in a very uncertain, you know, uh, protocol here, uh, or time. But um, you're right. I mean, once, once they've, they've tried to calibrate this with respect to vulnerability to, to severe disease and death, um, and, and also to opening up the economy. So mm -hmm. you have to sort of think about where do you integrate those two big arms of necessary vaccination? Not that everyone's isn't necessary, but I mean, at some point with limited supplies or, you know, they're rolling out over time, you have to do that. It's a medical triage. I, I'm glad I'm not having to make those calls because right, exactly. those are big ethical well, discussions. But I, I think that, and maybe I'm making this up, maybe I dreamt it, early in the, the, the pandemic, wasn't the CDC guideline for closing down the economy a 3% positivity rate? Yeah, right. I mean, that well, that was if your local prevalence yeah. was 3%, or well, some said 3, some said 5. But, but still, um, but if we're still, running it was in 40, the, It was in the low single digits, yeah. yeah. And, and then you would, you'd want to sort of shut things down temporarily. And, and I think that um, in certain instances, that probably makes sense. Uh, that along with just being very rigorous and asking people to be cognizant of their of their social hygiene. Mm -hmm. We saw that in our area. There was, frankly, I think uh, uh, it's typical of rural folks. I've lived in metro, suburban, exurban, and now rural, and um, being born in St. Louis and practiced there for what, 18, 20 years. Um, I, it's, it, the, rural folks are ruggedly independent, and they've had to be, and they make do, and they find a way to get by when no one else is there to help them when the chips are down. And and I think um, they also tend to, uh, well, to d just be skeptical of, of government intervention. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're freedom-loving folks. And so, um, again, given the, the current environment and all the rhetoric going flying around the, the internet and so forth, uh, they were very, very skeptical that any of this made any sense in terms of the public health guidances. And um, it wasn't until we started doing a bunch of uh, multimedia campaigns. We've been on local you know, national, regional media of all types, 
getting the word out. And until that six degrees of separation from the infection, which we had been in the rural parts insulated from, mm-hmm. um, from infection, when that came close to home, boy, suddenly that 38% started to plummet because mm-hmm. people started to take it seriously. Mm-hmm. So without going into the organic chemistry and all of that, uh, the vaccines that are currently on the market, in your opinion, are those safe? Should we all be rip-roaring ready to go? Should we take a wait-and-see attitude? Where do you stand on that? Yeah, well, I, again, I think it's important folks that folks understand, and you guys understand what's, where I come from. I tend to be conservative in my adaptation of new drugs, pharmaceuticals in general. I tend to not be an early or even a mid, but maybe just past midpoint adapter Mm -hmm. after I've got a pretty good sense that things are working. And that's because a lot of times these drugs are not tested to the degree Mm -hmm. and don't have the same biological uh, mechanism of action that's as certain uh, and as comfortable to me as are these vaccines. They're a remarkable bit of technology. They make so much biological plausibility I rolled up my sleeve. I was one of the first ones at the hospital to get one, largely so we could just make the point to all of the skeptical folks Mm -hmm. in and outside our building. And so maybe if that says something, maybe it says something. So either either fool or or, you know good choice. I don't know. We'll see. Well, but the research. On the other hand, go ahead. The research on these vaccines has been in place for ten to fifteen years. I mean, Mm -hmm. these guys have been doing this work behind the scenes forever, Mm -hmm. and it's a serendipity experience that suddenly this particular vaccine presents itself, and the technology they've been working on is now available, and it just all comes together. Right. This platform was developed uh, for the swine flu and, and back in 910 mm-hmm. and, and for Zika. They just never got a chance to really use it extensively or had the pressure to do it because those things petered out before that became really necessary. But it is elegant technology. And, yeah. uh, and I think it's, I would call it a clean vaccine in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine and the J&J that are in their phase three trials and will probably be coming out in February and augment our vaccine supply. Mm-hmm. Um, and by the way, which are unlikely to be as effective, but still, you know, uh, very, very good. Mm-hmm. Um, They're talking about 70, those are built 70%, on the, on the traditional platform of, of, a, of a disabled, non-infectious um, adenovirus, which is a, a cold virus, as the vector. And then they just will take a snippet. They'll connect that virus vector to a snippet that represents the, the code for the spike protein. And then that gets into our, into, into our body, and that's what uh, stimulates the immune response there. And, um, you know, it's, those vaccines take a long time to develop and produce. They require the, the old-fashioned egg production, whereas these vaccines can be produced much more rapidly mm-hmm. using, you know, the modern, you know, uh, techniques that are just incredible. The- and so while there, we're probably going to see a few reactions to the uh, polyethylene glycol, which you might know as um, Miralax for constipation, mm. <laughs> Um, but it's used in toothpaste and hair things mm-hmm. and other, uh, Doxel, which is, a, which is a chemotherapeutic agent, uses it. Some people apparently have some antibodies to the PEG, uh, uh, which is the, one of the envelopes that, that, that the uh, RNA in, these bio, in the, bio, uh, the BioNTech, Pfizer, and Moderna vaccines are, are, are embedded in. Um, it seems as though those folks are the ones that are having these reactions. So when we give the vaccine, like everyone, we have a crash cart around, and if you know if someone has a reaction, we can deal with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's certainly, I think, a, a, I would be willing to pay that price to be immune. It'll be the I'd epitome. Be serious consideration. It'll be the epitome of irony if the vaccine becomes readily available, and I go down to Walgreens and I'm ready to roll up my sleeve, and they tell me all they have available is AstraZeneca. Yeah, right. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but, but, or worse, you know, you know what's scaring me is um, I, I, the, gover- the governor was unable to really push through, I think part, largely because he got a little cold feet when he saw the actual bill last in the special session they had. But uh, all across the country, there's concerns that whether it's treatment with, um, again, not as solid of evidence as we would traditionally have in this circumstance, um, whether it's treatment or diagnostics, um, and in this case, vaccine. Can you imagine a Walgreens or CVS or whoever else is administering it to have a, a few reactions and get mm-hmm. sued? And if they don't have some liability protection, mm-hmm. you know, I can see a real, real a, a cataclysm there. Just you know, of the nature you described. Not only well, maybe they they refuse to do the vaccine that has that little inherent risk. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, are they are they don't have the the most effective one? I mean, the Pfizer and the Modernas are. 94 percent 94 to 95 percent 
effective in reducing um, sickness from the illness. We don't know for sure whether it reduces asymptomatic carriage, but for people getting sick, right. which means they don't have a big viral load to spew even if they do sneeze or cough. Mm-hmm. And, and secondly, it's almost 100%, it's 99% effective in reducing severe disease. That mm-hmm. is unheard of in vaccine world. And even though the AstraZeneca vaccine is not going to be that effective, the big plus there is that it doesn't have to be refrigerated. So for areas of the world where that would be prohibitive, that's going to be a real boon for those areas so that people can get some kind of vaccination. No, you're so right. And and even when these there there's some indication and the, the data is, is sparse, but I imagine that just like with the influenza vaccine, even though it's quoted as only being between 30 and 60 percent in a good year, 60 percent effective. Most years it's 40, 50 ish. Right. Um, effective is defined as not getting sick. Well, those people who do get sick after a flu vaccine, I don't mean those that blame the vaccine on getting sick because that's mm-hmm. just a reaction. It's not the sickness. But who can truly get influenza? Um, they don't have the severity of disease. So I think that the AstraZeneca will have that little payoff as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so we have kept you long. I appreciate it so much. This has been. So it's fantastic. Been fascinating. Think, Thank you very much. Yeah, and I think that people uh, who hear this uh, are going to come away so much better informed. Just the whole spectrum of not only the disease, but the treatments that we have. Because it just feels like that there just isn't anything out there. But there really is stuff out there. We just haven't really been educated on it. You're right. It, it sound, and thank you for, for allowing me to, to help get the word out. I hope it's been encouraging to, to folks who are listening. But I, I really would be curious, maybe you can do a follow-up uh, podcast as to the psychology of, um, of declining something that could be so helpful and may actually save your life. I just think it's a fascinating analysis, as well as people who now know that there are treatments should you get mm-hmm. uh, diagnosed with. I think if people had sort of a futile attitude before it's like well if i get diagnosed what can you do right. so i don't want to get diagnosed and be under quarantine for two weeks but exactly probably let it more spread right. but that's an interesting mm-hmm. psychology fear of diagnosis um uh you know because of what may happen or what or, may or, happen. or they have another agenda i've got a vacation i bought the plane mm-hmm. tickets if i get diagnosed i can't go i'll just go ahead and go and, and take the risk and bingo yeah and you're right i heard that story well, there's hope now there's yeah. hope on the horizon yeah thanks gentlemen there really appreciate it, it. Thank you, Randy. And if you're ready to do that show, we're ready to do that show next week. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's one you guys can tackle. I know nothing about it because I can't make sense of it. But it's the same reason I don't get my annual PSA. I always wait a year and a half or two rather than a year. You know, I mean, it's, yeah. it's fear of the unknown, I guess. Mm-hmm. It's an interesting question, though. I'd love to hear you do something on it. Let me know if you do. Oh, we'll do it. Okay. All right, hey, we'll thanks so know. much. I look Thank forward you, to Randy. this. Thank you. Right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.